Hello, hello, Tony, your deck architect here, back on my channel once more with another deck profile. So, with the release of Births of Destiny comes a plethora of new decks for me to showcase. From new decks like the Floenderies to supported decks like the Magistus, I'm quite excited to bring you guys my take on those decks. But before we get there, I do believe I have a promise to keep. Thus, today's deck profile will have us bore deep into the earth to unearth new playable strategies for another fan favorite 2020 archetype. Drawing inspirations from stories of underground spelunking and expeditions, ladies and gentlemen, join me as we take a subterranean deep look at the Adamancipator. So to provide a bit of history on the Adamancipator, the Adamancipator were one of the three archetypes released in Secret Slayers. Based on Cave Explorers, the Animancipator played a loose but powerful game of chance, utilizing excavation effects to potentially fill the field with monsters to build incredible boards. At the time of their release, the Animancipator were a meta powerhouse, easily outspeeding the prior meta of the Eternal format to claim the de facto spot as the deck to beat. This was, in part, thanks to their assignment as one of the most overlooked but oversupported typings in the game, the Rock Typing. With cards like Block Dragon and Koaki Mera Guardian at their disposal, the Animancipator were not only resilient to most hand traps, but exhibited incredible recovery and consistency to boot. These advantages would ultimately see Block Dragon get banned in the following ban list, which promptly saw the decks fall into rogue obscurity. And while many engines have since been introduced to try to make these miners competitive once more, the deck never fully recovered from that faithful ban list to dominate once more. Which brings us to today. With Birth of Destiny already promising a huge shift to today's meta, there is very little incentive for us to try to create something ultra competitive for the current metagame. Thus, today's deck profile will be a more unconventional take on this archetype, aiming to instead utilize this deck's unique rock mechanics to generate more creative displays of combo. And with that, I believe I've droned on for too long. Without a further ado, Let's get into the deck profile. Getting right into things, we started off by introducing our entire Ad Emancipator lineup, consisting of a playset of each Ad Emancipator tuner, with our three Ad Emancipator researcher, three Ad Emancipator seeker, and three Ad Emancipator analyzer. Each of these Ad Emancipators share a common effect in that they can excavate the top five cards of the deck and special summon one level four or lower non-tuner rock monster from among them. This effect serves as the crux of the Ad Emancipator strategy, allowing each Ad Emancipator to spawn an additional rock monster directly from the deck without additional resources. This effectively facilitates a one card synchro summon of any monster from levels 3 to 8, giving the deck incredibly flexible synchro capabilities. Now, since this effect summons the monster with no limitations whatsoever, we can also take advantage of this effect to summon monsters with powerful effects that can extend our plays. In fact, a majority of our targets are intended to do exactly that. The ultimate idea is to utilize your Ad Emancipator swarming effects to summon out one such extender to hopefully find a way into another Ad Emancipator to then repeat the process. Doing this successfully in sequence allows you to flood your board with a constant stream of tuners and non-tuners that you can then convert into a full board of powerful synchro monsters. This strategy is made much easier thanks to the secondary effects that each Ad Emancipator possess, which allow them to special summon themselves onto the field under certain conditions. For example, Researcher is the most generic, able to special summon herself as long as you control another rock monster. Seeker is similar, able to special summon himself so long as you control another Ad Emancipator. Finally, Analyzer functions much like a Cyber Dragon, able to special summon himself so long as only your opponent controls a monster. Through a combination of this swarming effect and their excavation effects, each Ad Emancipator acts as both an extender and a starter in itself, and this gives the deck incredible flexibility and fluidity in its plays, as opening a number of miners gives you a number of different ways you can begin or progress your board. And this means that a majority of your end boards will be made out of very little set combos in mind, making this deck very hard to choke point and disrupt. So with the general Ad Emancipator idea covered, we then move on to the more important aspect of the deck, that being the core targets for your Ad Emancipator effects. Now currently, there exist several viable engines for your Ad Emancipators to summon. 
You could go with a Prankids engine, with the core goal being to summon out Prankids Roxies to facilitate additional link plays. Or you could go with a Kowaki Mural package, with the core goal being to summon out Rock Thumb monsters like Golem and Wool for additional disruptions. But the engine that I've chosen to play today is an extended Magnet Warrior package. This engine consists of 1 Gamma the Magnet Warrior, 1 Beta the Magnet Warrior, 3 Delta the Magnet Warrior, as well as 3 Beta the Electro Magnet Warrior. Now to preface, this is not the first time Magnet Warriors have seen play in Ad Emancipator. Very early on in the deck's career, the vanilla Magnet Warriors saw play as a miniature swarming engine that could both be summoned by your Ad Emancipators as well as Unexpected Die. In this instance of the deck, that is still the case with our inclusion of Beta and Gamma. However, the expanded inclusion of both Delta as well as Electromagnetic Beta allows us to do some additional interesting combos. To start with our Delta, Delta when summoned allows you to dump a Magnet Warrior from your deck to the graveyard. This effect is useful in helping you fill your graveyard up with Magnet Warriors, which you can then revive with a number of other effects. One such preferred dump target is your Beta the Electro Magnet Warrior. Beta, when summoned, can search for any Magnet Warrior from your deck to your hand. This gives us a way to grab a level 4 Magnet Warrior to our hand, which we can then use for something like our Doki Doki to then summon out a Analyzer from deck. Furthermore, Beta can also tag out for any level 4 Magnet Warrior on our opponent's turn. This is especially relevant given our access to Christian Halka Fibrax, who can tag out for any Synchro Tuner on our opponent's turn as well. Combining these two effects together, we can access a number of different disruptive Synchros on our opponent's turn, ranging from a level 7 to a level 10 depending on the opponent. Finally, because Beta is a level 3 Earth Monster, he can also be used alongside any Animancipator level 2 tuner to make the Chariot Beast, effectively giving our deck a Floodgate option that we can access with ease. Wrapping up the remainder of our Rock Monsters, we have 3 of the aforementioned Doki Doki as well as 3 Kowaki Mirror Guardian. On top of being additional targets for our Animancipator excavation effects, both monsters have powerful utility effects that can help us establish boards. Doki Doki allows us to discard any rock in our hand to summon a rock monster from our deck with the same attribute and level. Given that a majority of our rock monsters are either level 4 or level 2 earth monsters, this essentially allows us to convert dead rocks in our hand into live ones onto the field. For example, I can discard any level 4 Magnet Warrior from my hand to summon out an Analyzer from my deck. Alternatively, since Doki Doki does not have any limitation on what it can summon, I can discard a Rock Monster in my hand to summon out the same Rock Monster from my deck. At worst, I can trade one of the dead Ad Emancipator level 2 tuners in my hand to access the other level 2 Ad Emancipator tuner, allowing me to continue my plays from there. Guardian, on the other hand, operates as our insurance policy for the deck. By tributing Guardian in response to any monster effect, Guardian can negate that monster effect, meaning that at minimum, we can summon him to insulate our Ad Emancipator plays from hand traps. However, at maximum, we can end on a number of Guardians to actually act as disruption on our opponent's turn. Now, it's important to note that Guardian also has a maintenance cost of revealing a rock at the end of your turn, lest it destroy itself. Thus, it's important to remember that you have to keep a rock in hand for him to live to your opponent's turn if you intend to use him as disruption. So, if you project that you won't have a rock by your end of the turn, which is likely, don't be free to use Guardian at least as a level 4 rock monster for your synchro plays to make the most use out of him. Then, rounding off the monsters with the hand traps, we have 3 Ash Blossom and Joy Spring, as well as 2 Effect Veiler. On top of supplementing whatever end board we make with further disruptions, our Ash Blossom also serve an additional purpose in this deck. To preview on ahead, our Ad Emancipator Synchro monsters pack additional effects on our opponent's turn if we have a corresponding attributed monster in our graveyard. As it so turns out, our Ad Emancipator Risen Leonite requires a fire type monster, of which our Ash is. Thus, by disrupting with Ash, we also turn online our Leonite for additional plays on our opponent's turn, which can lead to some very interesting interactions that I hope I get to cover in our combo component. Going into our back row, the Ad Emancipator deck actually runs a fairly low spell and trap count, 
The reason being that due to the randomness of our Adamantipator excavation effects, it actually does us a disservice to run spells and traps that would otherwise be dud excavates off of the top. Thus, the only spells we aim to run are cards that can extend our board state. Starting it off, we have our only Adamantipator spell in our arsenal in our 3 Adamantipator sign. Sign operates almost identical to a Monster Reborn. When activated, it targets a rock monster in your graveyard and special summons it. However, if you were to specifically summon an Adamantipator monster, Sign then allows you to stack a level 4 or lower rock monster directly to the top of your deck. At the bare minimum, Sign allows you to revive a rock monster from your graveyard. This actually has some pretty cool synergy with cards like your Magnet Warrior Delta, who can put a Magnet Warrior into your graveyard to be revived. But at the average, this card is a 1 card synchro setup. By reviving any Animantipator from your graveyard, which can include your synchros, you can stack any eligible rock to be excavated by said Animantipator to then go into a synchro. This effectively ensures that you will never whiff on your next excavation effect, but also allows you to pick and choose a specific rock monster you want off the top. Expanding this further, this means that Signs essentially acts as a pseudo e telly for any level 4 or lower rock monster in your deck which can be incredibly useful when it comes to finding that right rock monster needed to extend your combos. Moving on from there, we have a suite of support cards for our Magnet Warrior package. We're playing one Magnetic Field as well as two Magnet Induction. Starting with our Magnetic Field, Magnetic Field is a field spell that operates much like a continuous revival for our Magnet Warriors. While you control a level 4 or lower earth rock monster, which all of our monsters are, Magnetic Field can target and revive one level 4 or lower Magnet Warrior from your graveyard. This effect is just another way to help us put a rock monster onto the field while also allowing us to get additional mileage off of cards like our Delta and Beta. Additionally, a Magnetic Field also has a nifty effect that allows us to bounce any monster that battles our earth rock monsters at the end of the damage step. This effect is actually really useful as it turns all your rock monsters into mini suicide bombers that you can purposely crash into monsters to out them. And while the effect theoretically requires you to lose advantage to get there, it does much in helping you out lockdown monsters like Winda who would otherwise be impervious to other removal. Magnet Induction on the other hand operates much like another extender for our Magnet Warriors. While you control a Magnet Warrior, Magnet Induction can special summon a Magnet Warrior from your deck with a different name from the ones on the field. This effect essentially allows us to multiply our Magnet Warriors, giving us a way to access Delta and Beta directly from the deck so long as we find a way into any other Magnet Warrior. Now, because it's not always guaranteed that we will have a Magnet Warrior on the field, this card can be a little dead at times, which is why we only play two. However, setting that aside, the ability to turn any Magnet Warrior into two Magnet Warriors does help in setting up some of our plays. While our ability to access an Adamantipator Tuner can be easy, it is a little harder at times for us to ensure we have access to a level 4 Rock Non-Tuner. Magnet Induction makes this a little easier, guaranteeing us a second Rock Monster without the need to gamble on our excavations. Finally, rounding off the deck with the remainder of our spells and no traps, we have 3 Unexpected Die for summoning out our Vanilla Magnet Warriors, 1 Reasoning for additional excavation and extension, 1 Monster Reborn among the many we already play, as well as 1 Foolish Burial to dump any rock monster we may want to revive. Going into the extra deck, we start by putting a specific focus on our 3 Adamantipator Synchro Monsters in 1 Adamantipator Risen Raptite, 1 Adamantipator Risen Leonite, and 1 Adamantipator Risen Dragite. Like their non-synchro counterparts, each of these Adamantipator Risen Monsters have an effect to excavate the top 5 cards of the deck and do something relative to the rocks excavated. Raptite can summon any rock monster from among the excavated. Leonite can add any Animancipator card among the cards excavated, while Dragite can bounce cards your opponent controls equal to the number of rocks excavated. For most intents and purposes, both Leonite and Raptite are used to help you grab into another Animancipator tuner to continue your plays. Raptite can dig for any rock monster, not just a non-tuner rock, meaning that you can summon out your Animancipator miners among of what you excavate. Likewise, Lee and I can excavate for any Adamantipator card, which can include your miners but also Adamantipator signs as well. Dragite, on the other hand, is your endgame. 
packing 3,000 attack and the ability to potentially clear the field, you'll be using Dragite's effect to out pesky threats to then go for game with your full board. This effect is especially powerful given that it does not target and does not destroy, allowing Dragite to out pesky threats like Dragoons or pesky floaters like Tri Brigades with relative ease. The Animancipator Risen also have a secondary effect that can be activated on your opponent's turn if you have a monster of their corresponding attribute in the graveyard. Leonite can special summon one rock monster from your graveyard while you have a fire monster in your graveyard. Raptite can banish one monster from either graveyard while you have a wind monster in your graveyard. Finally, Dragite can negate any spell or trap while you have a water monster in your graveyard. Now, outside of Leonite with Ash, we aren't actually playing any other attributes in our main deck to make these effects live. However, we do have ways to set up said attribute using our X deck in accordance to what we have on the field. In most cases, the two effects that will be the most important is our Leonite and our Dragite. Leonite being able to revive any rock from the grave opens us up not only to reviving monsters for plays with Kristjan Hauka Firebacks, but also reviving Guardians for further disruption. Dragite, on the other hand, is just directly generic spell and trap negation, fantastic for bolstering an existing board against spells like Lightning Storm or traps like Evenly Matched. With the Adamant's Pater Synchros now covered, we wrap up the remainder of our X deck starting with one Naturia Beast that we can make using an Adamant's Pater Tuna and a Beta, one Shooting Riser Dragon as well as one Christron Quandax as our Christron Hauka Fibrax targets, one Don Drexer that we can make using a Quandax and a Beta, one Crystal Ring Synchro Dragon that we can make using any level 6 Animancipator Synchro and any level 2 Tuner. One Baron de Fleur that we can make using an Animancipator level 6 Synchro and a level 4 Tuner. One Satellite Warrior made similarly. One Gallant Granite for Rock Searching. One Gorgonic Guardian that you can make using 2 Beta, it comes up. One Abyss Dweller for Graveyard Hate. One Divine Arsenal Zeus in case Arc sees battle, as well as the one aforementioned Christian Hauka Fibrax. Now it's at this point that we once again reach the combo component of the deck profile. Now, due to the semi-random nature of our Animancipator effects, there aren't exactly any set combos that I can definitively show you without having to gamble off the top. Thus, we're going to be doing two test hands for this combo component. I'm going to draw a hand of 5 and try to build the best board possible from it, adapting from what I get off my Ad Emancipator effects. With that being said, the deck is shuffled, the field is ready, let us begin. Beginning with our first test hand, the hand that we're going to be working with first consists of 1 Ad Emancipator Signs, 1 Ad Emancipator Analyzer, 1 Ad Emancipator Researcher, 1 Magnet Induction, as well as 1 Magnetic Field. Okay, this is technically a good hand. Not only did we open two Adamantipator tuners, which are crucial for any play, but we've also opened three fantastic extenders. Magnet Induction essentially allows us to grab any Magnet Warrior from our deck, while Science and Magnet Field serve as revival for our Magnet Warriors. There's only one problem with this hand. We don't have a Magnet Warrior to actually make these cards alive. Thus, we're going to hopefully try to get one off of our minor effects. Starting our plays off, we're going to begin by normal summoning out our Ad Emancipator Analyzer and activating its effect to reveal a Ash, a Veiler, a Ad Emancipator Analyzer, one Monster Reborn, as well as a Doki Doki, of Doki Doki being the only viable target. And while Doki Doki is a good card, it's not quite what we're looking for, especially since we can't use it to summon out a Magnet Warrior. Thus, we won't have to extend with our Researcher. Since I control Rock Monster, I can Special Summon Outset Researcher, and I'm going to then use Researcher's effect to reveal off the top another Doki Doki, a Reasoning, a Gamma, a Unexpected Die, as well as a Guardian. Now, the Guardian would be nice, but in this case, we know what we want, and that's going to be that Gamma, of which we'll Special Summon in Attack Position. From there, since I control a Magnet Warrior, I can now activate my Magnet Induction to Special Summon another Magnet Warrior from my deck, of which I'll Special Summon out my beta. Beta upon being summoned will then allow me to add my delta to my hand. From there, we're then going to link away both the electromagnet beta as well as the researcher to then summon out our link monster in our Christian Hauka Fibrax. With Hauka Fibrax then triggering to then special summon out a second researcher from our deck. 
the reason I choose to summon out Researcher is because while we've already used Researcher's effect, it means that if we want to dig for a playable card, it's not going to be that. Thus, we thin our deck out of one dead target. Regardless, since I freed up space, I can then activate Doki Doki's effect, discarding the Delta from my hand to summon an Earth Rock monster from my deck, of which I'm going to summon out the Guardian to insulate my plays from further hand traps. Then, with all my effects used, I'm then going to Synchro Summon using the Doki Doki and the Analyzer to make my first Ad Emancipator Synchro in my Raptite. Before then Synchro Summoning using the Researcher as well as the Gamma to make my second Ad Emancipator Synchro in my Leonite. Now, instead of having to play the random game with our Raptite, we're going to activate the Science to bring back our Researcher. In doing so, since we brought back an Ad Emancipator, Science will then allow me to stack a Rock Monster to the top of my deck, of which I'll stack the Seeker. This guarantees that my Raptite, when I use its effect, will have a guaranteed target for me to Special Summon, in this case being that Seeker. Now, since I have used Raptite's effect, I can then Synchro with it as well as my Researcher to then summon out my first negation in my Crystal Wing Synchro Dragon. Now, the next part is going to work depending on what I get off my Leonite. If I do manage to get an Ad Emancipator Rock Monster to my hand, I can do two different kinds of plays. If not, I'm going to have to gamble a little further. But activating Leonite's effect, I'm going to reveal off the top a Signs, an Unexpected Die, a Analyzer, a Monster Reborn, as well as a Doki Doki. And in this case, I'm actually going to grab the Analyzer. I'm not going to use it in this case. The purpose of me grabbing the Analyzer is so I have something to reveal for my Guardian in the end phase. Regardless, I'm then going to activate my Magnetic Field, and since I control a level 4 or lower Rock Monster, I can activate Magnetic Field's effect to then bring back from my Graveyard my Beta the Electromagnet Warrior, of which I'll then Synchro Summon with my Seeker to summon out a Nature Beast. Then I'll go to my end phase, revealing the Analyzer from my hand to keep my Guardian on the field and pass turn to my opponent. Going into our opponent's turn, let's do a quick head count here. In terms of monster effect negation, we have one Guardian as well as one Crystal Wing. Furthermore, we also have a Nature Beast which can negate as a non-once per turn effect any spell our opponent activates. This gives us a total of technically three disruptions on our opponent's turn. But what if I told you we can do a little more than that? At the earliest convenience, we're going to activate Hauka Fibrax's effect, banishing it to summon out a shooting Riser Dragon onto the field. Riser Dragon's effect will then activate, sending an Ash from my deck to the graveyard. To then make it a level 4. Then, at the earliest monster effect activation, we can then activate Guardian's effect to then tribute it to negate that monster effect. But, since we sent Ash and now we have a fire monster in the graveyard, we can then activate Leonite's second effect to then bring back the Guardian to use it again. Upon doing so, with Leonite's effect now spent, we can then activate Shooting Riser's effect as a level 4 Synchro Tuner to Synchro with said Leonite to then make a level 10 Synchro in our Baron de Fleur. This effectively gives us two more negations than we had before for a total of five negations on our opponent's turn. Going into our second test hand, the hand that we're going to be working with second is going to consist of one Beta the Magnet Warrior, one Ad Emancipator Researcher, one Ad Emancipator Seeker, one Beta the Electro Magnet Warrior, as well as one Foolish Bale. Uh, e, this hand is not as great as you think it is. While we technically did open combo in these three cards alone, we did actually open two semi-bricks in our beta and our foolish burial. See, while I want to normal summon the beta to get the search off, it would do me no good if I can't find a rock monster, so at least minimum to guarantee I have a play, I'm going to normal summon out the beta instead. From there, since I control rock monster, I can then special summon out my researcher, and I am going to activate researcher's effect to get off the top, a veiler, a seeker, a analyzer, a magnetic field, as well as a monster reborn. <coughs> Unfortunate, that is actually just an entire whiff, which means we will be summoning nothing out of it. Fortunately, we still have a Seeker which we can special summon since we control an Ad Emancipator in our Researcher. Again, we're going to activate Seeker's effect, we're going to reveal out the top an Ash, a Reasoning, an Unexpected Die, another Unexpected Die, and a Ad Emancipator Signs. <coughs> oh, that's extremely unfortunate because that is now a second whiff. No matter, fortunately for us, we can still Synchro Summon with our beta as well as our researcher, and while I do want to somehow make Raptite, I do believe the right play is to make Leonite instead. 
The reason being that with all those cards revealed, if I hopefully can get a science off the top, I can make use of this foolish bail for some very interesting plays. Activate Leonette's effect, I'm going to reveal off the top of one Delta, a second Delta, a Beta, a Guardian, and a Gamma. Wow, that's really unfortunate. So once again, we have whipped for the third time, and with that being the case, we then Synchro Summon with our Leonite and our Seeker to make a Crystal Wing Synchro Dragon, and then pass turn to our opponent. Now, while I do believe that was a pretty sorry demonstration of what Adam Emancipator can do, I do believe that there is still a learning opportunity to be found here. Ultimately, while Adam Emancipator are powerful in their ability to dig off the top for almost any rock monster that they may need, it is still a deck that relies on RNG to play. And as a result of that, while the deck has an amazing ceiling, there are situations where you may just end your turn purely because you don't find what you need off the top, or in this case, three times off the top. And that means some boards you may just end off with a crystal wing or worse, despite how good you may have opened. Now obviously, there are a few things I could have done better. I could have gone for the Raptite instead to summon out another monster to hopefully extend, but I went with the Leonite believing that that was the best play in mind, being able to grab the science to then act with Foolish Bale to dump a rock to stack the rock with our science to continue my play from there. And that too is sometimes how you might have to play at Emancipator, taking the gamble to make the best play possible. And that's going to do it for our Adam Emancipator deck profile. Now, being realistic, I can say that this variant of the deck is the most competitive. Lacking the flexibility of the Prank Kids engine and the full installation of the Kwaki Miro engine, there are indeed better options if you want to play this deck on a more competitive front. But by god is this deck fun to play. Very few decks get to access the full synchro spectrum, and even fewer get to do so while using Yugi's Timeless Magnet Warriors to do it. And with new Magnet Warrior support just over the horizon in Battle of Chaos, I can only imagine this deck getting crazier from here. With that being said though, this will be my only Synchro Storm related deck profile for the foreseeable future. While I want to do Lyrilisk, I think I'll wait for Brothers of Legend for when they get the full breadth of their support to explore. So instead, look forward to Bursa Destiny deck profiles from here on in. Regardless, this has been Tony, your deck architect, with an Adam Emancipator deck profile. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you guys next time.